Well, welcome and thank you for joining us for this pre-concert talk as we're about to launch our 20th anniversary season. Where have those 20 years gone and, and yet we just, we're just coming out of a summer? How was your summer, Wells? Was there a summer? Well, I mean, it still feels toasty. like summer. A little warm. Yeah, a little warm. <laughs> it's good that we're doing Frosty on it. Yeah, right. To start. <laughs> to start. Indeed. Indeed. Um, but it's great to be back and people are really excited about the season and particularly excited mm -hmm. about several things throughout the season, but especially this program because people just love these programs that you put together. And, and if you don't mind me just asking a question about um, how you decide to put things together before we might even talk about some individual pieces, yeah. because I think the beauty of these kinds of programs, which are a mixture of different things that may have some linkages, and they certainly do, um, the, the, the beauty of them is that they seem natural. So when an audience is listening, oh yeah, yeah, that, that's happening, but it's not that easy. No, it's not, and and um, but it's it's a fun challenge. Um, you know, it's easy to program the B minor mass yeah. in the St. John Passion. Well, that's well, it. Done. <laughs> you know, that, that, was, that was easy. Um, no, it's these programs that are. Um, you use the word cornucopia. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, good, good word. <laughs> um, I might say smorgasbord. <laughs> also good. Also good. Um, of of just musical gems, um, and usually it's. There's a, there's a theme that runs through it. And this particular program that we start with is, is really a signature program for us because it's, it's folk songs and spirituals. It's, it's Americana. We're calling it Songs of America. And um, these have been uh, much loved programs over the years that we've done um, many times during our 20 years. So it seemed fitting on this 20th anniversary season that we return to this formula but your question about how you put these programs together, it is tricky because, um, you know, in this program, there's, you know, 10, 12 pieces of music. And it's, it's like putting together a, a jigsaw puzzle, if you will, to, to create a picture that, that tells a story. And in this case, it's the story of America and uh, at least a, a snapshot of it. Yeah. And what we'd like to do is celebrate and acknowledge and shine a light on the, several of the folk song and spiritual traditions that make up uh, the wonderful uh, history we have of, of music in, in, in these United States. So we do African-American spirituals. On this program, we're doing some pieces uh, that reflect uh, the, the Mexican tradition. Um, even we do some classic Americana, as you mentioned, to start the program with, with Frostiana, but we're also doing a, a, a really special piece by Raven Chacon that, that won the Pulitzer and uh, which makes him the first Native American to win that very prestigious prize. And uh, this is the first time any of his music has been played by a music organization in Tucson. Okay, great. So even though he has some Tucson connectivity, mostly through Tucson MoCA, our new partner, yeah. which you conquered, and there's an exhibit up right now that people can go see called While Hissing, this is the first time any of the music organizations have done one of his works, which I didn't even know wow. until yesterday. Well, that's really cool. Um, so it, it is very exciting. And the Pulitzer, if I might just tell a quick anecdote. Yeah. Um, yesterday when, when talking to him, a, a journalist said, so were you surprised by getting it? And he laughed and he said, completely. He said, right. I had no idea. Yeah. I was installing a show of visual art. I turned my phone on, on mute. And that was the day they were trying to call him. <laughs> and he turned it back on two hours later and it blew up completely. Oh, wow. um, and it's what hard. it's done is not only brought notice to this particular work, Voiceless Mass, that you're gonna be conducting, but also everything else in his, yeah. in his workshop. So it's, it's exciting and, and it belongs in this program. That's the other, such, such a cool thing that you've done. Um, I once asked Robert Shaw about these kind of cornucopia potpourri yeah. programs, and I had this long sort of dissertation about why I thought he did this, and Mr. Shaw, does this, this piece talk to that one? And he looked at me sort of quizzically the whole time, and I finished, and he said, I just like the way they go together. <laughs> I said, well, is there magic to this order? No. I could, yeah. I, could, I could do it reverse next tomorrow. Well, night. seriously, that, that's part of it, too. It, it just has to feel right, and... and has to feel right for me. I, I'm thinking about you know the the demands on the on the musicians. Of course, I'm thinking about the demands on the audience. You know, there's a lot of pieces on this program that's just sort of sit back and bathe in it and 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 relax. And there are other pieces that you know you have to sit up and 
and pay attention. Um, they demand attention. Yeah. In so, a good way. Exactly. So, um, you know, just trying to balance all of that out over the course of a, a, the length of a concert. Yeah. And I, I, should, I just should say, for the stage crew, there are also issues too. And yeah. I know you think about that a lot. How long a pause do we want? If it is a long pause, are we going to fill it with something? You know, how, how does that all happen? And what I love about the way you put these together I think the first time I heard True Concord, it was one of these programs, is that um, you're thinking about all, the pacing of it all the time. You don't want to lose people, but there are moments when you might want to give them a little time, especially yeah. the piece that happens before intermission. Yeah, that's right. So maybe let's start at the top. Great. Um, so we start with a really classic piece, um, Frosty Anna, uh, a, a piece by Randall Thompson, one of the great American composers often unsung it's um you know hard to live in the shadow of, of copeland and bernstein yeah but um even howard hansen and roger sessions mm -hmm. i mean he was relegated to kind of the choral world yeah which is unfortunate because he's got three wonderful symphonies but but he's a really good composer yeah. and this might be one of his most well-known pieces um pieces of music that set poetry of robert frost one of the great american uh, poets um, it's in seven movements, and it's it's highly descriptive music. It's it's almost programmatic, um, in that it's it's describing various scenes. You know, a, a, a scene in the in the country, and the, and the scene, and when there's snow coming uh, falling down, and, and um, it, it it's it's it it just strikes me as being um, it really like we're creating a canvas of, of very of, visual of, of yeah. America. And, yeah. And particular part of it this Agreed. being commissioned for the bicentennial of the city of Amherst uh, Massachusetts and Frost was from Amherst I think maybe that was also a actually connection. I don't know we'll have to fact check that but yes. I uh, these two knew each other Frost and and Thompson and they had mutual respect for one another I think it was you that told me that, that no one else had set um, Previous was a they had not any frost and no, and no one was allowed to after wow this this okay. was the piece wow that's really cool uh, there's an apocryphal story that apparently at the end of it frost got up and said sing it again oh right yeah yeah I saw that which too. is yeah, whether yeah. it happened or not it's a great yeah, story yeah well because it, it's great music and it it's is. great poetry it is um, so a really good way to start the program and and that's one of those pieces that um, you can sit back and just sort of bathe in it because it's it's um, there's a simplicity yet a profound beauty to it. Yeah. Um, so a good way to set the tone for the concert and for the season. And then what I wanted to do is is follow that with something that that contrasts it significantly, and that's Raven's piece, um, which has it's it's called voiceless mass because. There are no voices, at least there are no singing voices. Right. Although we have the voices of a small ensemble, um, including the organ, which uh, winded as it is, is a way of a voice instrument. That's right, if you will. That was his thought, yeah. Um, and so it's, well, the Frostiana is about just celebrating and just sitting back and enjoying all that all the beauty of nature that we take for granted especially you know those of us who've been in privileged classes um and yet there is a number of people in this country who have not enjoyed the um the benefit of uh, of ownership and place and, and and having a place that's truly their own and yeah. i think that's where Raven comes in with his piece and the message that he's he's wanting to convey. Definitely. Um, I think you put it beautifully and, and it's gonna be a wonderful performance and the juxtaposition is, is really terrific because the Randall Thompson piece is one of those pieces that people always say this to me when they hear it, they think they've heard it a million times. It is ingrained in their sense of what America is mm -hmm. in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a tough thing for a lot of people today to sort of think about things American. It's not patriotic, yep. but it is about the country. It is about place. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way that Voiceless Mass is about place, even if that place may not have always been open to everybody. That's right, that's right. And in this place, um, Arizona, Tucson, this, in which we're just surrounded by incredible beauty, by the beauty of nature, um, something that you know I'm guilty of taking for granted. And, um, 
it's it's something we have to really deeply appreciate. And the cultural tapestry of it as well, right? So it is scenic beauty, um, unlike very many places in, ever in the world. Um, that's why so many Canadians come here all the time. I think that's why. Um, might be the chorizo. Um, but it, it's, it's, that's what I, I think, how, again, how you put this together, um, people will find very interesting and not jarring, but it'll make them think. Thought provoking yeah. for sure. Yeah, for in, sure. In a, in a good way. Yeah. And, and I think True Concord audiences and I think audiences that love choral music have that kind of built in. It could be the sacred liturgical part of where mm -hmm. choral music comes from, but I think it's much bigger vision than that, a yeah. much wider lens. Yeah. But I would, you know, I often say when we're doing a, a piece like the St. John Passion, which we're going to be doing later this year, and whether you're a religious person or not, that's a, that's a piece of art that you need to experience just because it is, it is so unique and so special. And I think people need to experience Raven's piece like that because like the St. John Passion, it doesn't come around very often. Yeah. And the last time we performed at the St. John was 10 years ago, and that's the last time it was performed in this part of the country. Yeah. Um, this, as you mentioned, this will be the Southwest premiere of Raven's piece, and the first time that in Tucson, anyway, Raven's music has been performed. Right. He's had, uh, with his art exhibits at MoCA, there have been some musical elements sometimes, and they've brought in some musicians to play other kinds of music, but this is, this is a premiere in many different ways. So not to be missed. Yeah. So um, we follow Raven's piece with intermission, and then we come back with another new piece, um, this by a up-and-coming emerging composer, and this is a result of our national emerging composers competition that we named after Stephen Paulus, now in its sixth year. Um, and this is a case where we received, I think, 99 submissions, which was the most we've ever received. Fantastic. Um, for, from young up-and-coming composers, and a winner was selected, um, adjudicated, by the way, by our composers in residence, uh, Jocelyn and Tim. But what was unique this year was we actually also went out looking for a new poem. I wanted a new poem for this, our 20th anniversary season. As you know, we get our name True Concord after Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And sonnet, sonnet number eight of Shakespeare talks about music's power to bring people together, which is really what our organization is about. And Absolutely. so I, I feel like we're, we're, um, our name is, is very fitting. So did Shakespeare write the poet? Oh, he wasn't available. <laughs> no, he wasn't available this time around. But what I wanted was a modern poem, a contemporary poet, to to get at this idea, but in, in more contemporary language. Um, so that was the theme that we were looking for when we put out uh, this call for, for poems. And again, we received dozens and dozens of submissions from all over the country, and the winner was from right next door in New Mexico, Janet Ruth. And so um, our winning composer from the composer's side, uh, Nicholas Ryan Kelly, um, took the poem of Janet Ruth and set it to music, and so we new have... New music, not something existing. New music, new yeah. music. Yeah. And so this will be the world premiere of um, A World That Shimmers. Great title. Uh, with words by Janet Ruth, so really excited to, to give that premiere as well. And a big shout out to our friends at the Poetry Center, right? Who you've been collaborating with since the very beginning. Indeed, we, you know, we, we've been doing this composer competition for six years, but we've never done a poetry competition. So good. competition. So our friends over at, at the UA Poetry Center helped us a great deal with that. Very exciting. Um, so I wanted to include some music by um, th that reflects the, the Mexican tradition. And um, there's a, a wonderful tradition, this goes back hundreds of years, about La Llorona, uh, which is this um, story of a, 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 a ghostly woman who's sort of resigned to um, to roaming the earth as she uh, laments the loss of her children. And so um, there's a lot of lore around this figure in, in Mexican traditions, and there's this beautiful piece. It's a funny story, by the way. A beautiful piece that was commissioned by the Santa Fe Desert Corral uh -huh. to um, to get at this, this um, folklore about La Llorona, and I was listening to a recording of it. I didn't know who the performers were. 
right, I found this recording, and it has a, a big alto solo. Hmm. And this alto is La Llorona. I mean, this is the, the Dolce Llorona. Hauntingly beautiful. And I kept listening to it, and I, and I kept hearing the voice of one of our singers, ah. the, the woman who sang the big alto solo in the Rachmaninoff Vespers. Ah. So finally I texted her, and she was you know, gonna be on for the show, and I said, Keely, um, I, there's this piece. I sent her, the, I sent her a, the PDF of this piece. I said, there's this piece, and I've heard this recording. I just keep hearing your voice. I, I, I think you really need to sing this. Do you, would you be up for it? And she writes right back and says, well, that was my voice. Uh, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Because the recording was of the Santa Fe Desert Chorale with her as the soloist. So, I mean, um, so she's coming back and she's gonna sing that. It's, it's just a stunning piece. We follow it with a really fun piece. This is a, a Mexican waltz by a Mexican-American composer, Maria Guerrero, who wrote you know, like a thousand songs in her life. This one is Tipitin, um, which didn't get off to a great start at first, but then it, it, it landed in pop, pop culture and the Andrews sisters got a hold of it and it, it really took off. Um, it's just a fun piece, very playful, about love, and um, follows nicely from uh, La Llorona. Beautiful. Yeah. And not as scary. Not as scary, yeah. <laughs> and when you do La Llorona, does she show up? Is that what we're going to expect? Somebody in the back of the theater? Or this well, we're not going to get overly or... dramatic here, okay. but um, her voice, Keeley's voice, if you remember it from oh, yes, very well. the Rachmaninoff. Stunning. She's got a quality to it that, that just brings, um, it, it's beautiful, but it has this gravitas to it that I think brings the weight that's necessary to carry this very storied uh, tradition um, to our concerts. Beautiful. Yeah, it's a very, very requiem mezzo, sort of yeah. Yeah. rich and dramatic, um, and, but, but a kind of, you, you use the word quality, and I think that's exactly what it is, and it was great in the Vespers. Yeah. Now we come up to the father of American uh, song here. This is Stephen Foster. These are pieces that are, 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 I know they're very special to many people and they're special to me too because I grew up with these. Um, you know, I grew up in a, a singing and musical household um, where every birthday party and anniversary turned into a, a sing along with my various family members playing all kinds of instruments and, and everybody else singing along and we sang these these pieces by, by Stephen Foster, um, Jeannie with the light brown hair and beautiful dreamer and, and Swanee River. And these, these, these pieces have been around a long time and have got real staying power yeah, because they're just, there's a, a nostalgia in them and a sentimentality that's, that's, that's not saccharine, but it's, 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 it's very organic and, and pure and, Beautiful. I think the word organic you just used is, is perfect because a lot of people think they were sort of handed down through history a folk song that no one knows who wrote them as opposed to someone who actually wrote all of them yeah. because they're so ingrained in, in American culture and American history yeah. and American yeah. landscape and all of that. Yeah. So these are really beautiful choral settings. So, so Foster wrote these tunes and then Composers have come along and, and, and set them for choir, and we've got some really tasty Great. arrangements of these pieces by, by Foster. And then we get into some um, spirituals, um, and maybe one of the best known, he's got the whole world in his hand. Um, this, this piece has been sung by so many people over the years, um, and this particular setting that we perform is, um, it's Margaret Bonds who took the tune and wrote um, a piece for piano and voice. And then Moses Hogan came along later and transcribed it for choir. Mm. So um, we get- What a great I, I know, right? Yeah. Right. Um, so you've got Margaret Bonds and you've got Moses Hogan, you know, sort of working together but separated by many years in, in arranging this piece that just, you know, it goes right to the heart. Um, and then William Dawson, who is a legend uh, in, in the compositional world, uh, his Ain't of That Good News, which is a piece that I sang back in college choir, and I just, 
it, it's a rousing, just a incredibly joy-filled piece of music and, and one, of, one of Dawson's uh, best-known spirituals. Classic, among so many that yes. he wrote and, and really, um, and, and what was great, one of the great things about his career is that he didn't achieve the fame that he should have, but he achieved more fame than most had. And it really put um, this music on the map, as did so many great opera singers, African-American opera singers who would use them as encores and bring them in and um, you know, Marian Anderson and Andrew Jackson and you know, all these yeah. incredible, Bobby McFerrin's yeah. father, Robert McFerrin yeah. Sr. and yeah. you know, these amazing artists that um, treated them not as uh, trifles to knock off at the end to please people, but um, every bit as important as the Schubert or the oh, yes. Brahms that was on oh, the program yes. at any given time. And in fact, you mentioned Marian Anderson. It was 60 years ago on the March in Washington that she sang He's Got the Whole World in His Hand. Exactly. I mean, it just a, an incredibly poignant moment in yeah. American history yeah. that it just seemed fitting to include it in this yeah. program. This I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> no. Anything else you want to share about this wonderful No, program? I just, you know, um, I, I do want to say that I am grateful um, that we have come to this point in our history where we're celebrating 20 years. It's, it, and and not, o not only is that its own miracle, but after COVID, even more so. Um, the resilience of this organization, of the board, of the audience, of the volunteers, of the singers, of the instrumentalists, um, everybody, uh, marvelous staff people that work really, really hard to put these things together and make them look like just falling off a log. Right, you know? right. No, it but really does take a village, and it's it's that that incredible support that we have felt, you know, in, including through those challenging times. You mentioned COVID. I mean, I go back to the Great Recession, too. I mean, that was a scary Definitely. time as well. But in each of these cases, I mean, our supporters have gotten us through and actually stronger on the other side. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful for that. And it's just, it feels like a really wonderful moment and a wonderful time to celebrate this community that's got us to this point with, with some of the just really great music of the world that yeah. we performed starting with this program, but but all the way through this season. So much more great music to come this year, and uh, we can't wait to see you. We hope that you've had a terrific summer. We look forward to coming together again with you here very soon. So please join us, take great care, and again, thank you very much for thank all you of too, us. Thank you, son.